Uh, the main point to remember is that methane is a huge problem, is not well documented, and we need to find out more about it. So to that end, I'm going to invite you, Daphne, Daphne Wisham, there you go, uh, to speak first, please. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, my name is Daphne Wisham. Uh, the CEO of Methane Action. I also wanted to thank my former colleague at the Center for Investigative Reporting, David Kaplan, uh, and the team at the Global Investigative Journalist Network for the honor of including Methane Action in this webinar today. Uh, Fiona has gone over some of the uh, critical aspects of, of methane, and of course we all know how damaging the rise in average temperatures of over one degree Celsius has been. But some scientists suggest we would see a sudden and additional rise in temperatures of roughly one degree Celsius or more, perhaps this decade, due to a sudden release of methane from the Arctic. Other scientists dispute whether the methane release would be sudden or slow, but we know that methane is now bubbling up from subsea permafrost that is melting in the Arctic now. Whether there is a 1% chance or a 70% chance of a sudden release, just the possibility of another one degree Celsius rise over a year or two is, uh, shall we say, terrifying. <laughs> um, and it's one reason that Methane Action is working with scientists and governments from around the world to track methane trends and develop an action plan to deal with them. Next slide. Um, I won't go over methane's global warming potential. Fiona covered that uh, well in her remarks, but suffice to say that methane is, of course, the second most important greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide. Uh, we're currently just under 419 parts per million CO2. Next slide. But if we include methane, we are already at an equivalent of over 500 parts per million CO2 and rising. What I would like to draw your attention to is that it's possible to remove methane from the atmosphere by enhancing its oxidation, speeding up what nature does already. Next slide. As Fiona mentioned, Methane Action's goal is to cut methane levels in half in the next couple of decades through aggressive mitigation of methane emissions plus methane removal. Some of the scientists we work with estimate that this could actually roll back climate forcing by 30 years or so and shave half a degree Celsius of warming uh, from peak levels in the climate system. That is a very hopeful prospect and one we welcome journalists digging into. Uh, this slide here summarizes the methane declaration that you can find on our website, which is methaneaction.org, which generated support from scientific experts from around the world, including uh, Michael Mann, Gus Beth, and uh, Stuart Pym, and, and others, Bill Muma, and others. Uh, roughly 60% of methane emissions come from human activity. The rest comes from uh, natural or biogenic sources. The primary sources of man-made methane emission are uh, agriculture and fossil fuels. And as Fiona mentioned, this new IEA report out just yesterday found that there is a widespread undercounting of methane emissions. And the US, Texas in particular, are among the worst offenders in undercounting and underreporting methane emissions. The other 40% of methane emissions come from wetlands, freshwater systems, and other natural sources. And there is evidence that wetlands methane emissions will intensify uh, as the planet warms. Next slide. There is also the fear I mentioned that thawing permafrost could release methane in a massive burst. The following few slides are prepared by Professor Peter Wadhams from Cambridge University. And this slide shows, uh, I guess you could do the, sorry, the next slide shows the deeper parts of the Arctic in dark blue and the shallower in pale blue. Next slide. And this slide shows how the shallower regions of the Arctic are warming rapidly as the ice melts. Uh, this results in, among other things, sub subsea permafrost, which uh, was created in the, in the last ice age. Uh, and it acts as a cap on billions of tons of methane. That cap is now deteriorating uh, with warmer ocean currents and is melting and releasing large quantities of methane. 
Next slide. The larger point is global warming will lead to more methane releases from biogenic sources, including subsea permafrost in the Arctic, which is in turn feeding more global warming, a kind of feedback loop. Conversely, cutting anthropogenic methane emissions plus removing the methane already in the atmosphere will be absolutely critical to avoiding faster and faster rises in biogenic methane emissions. There's new satellite data on methane emissions, which of course is very welcome, but it doesn't give a complete picture. So for example, tracking how much methane is leaking from Arctic permafrost will require investigative reporting skills to find and contextualize a range of sources. Some of the most reliable sources are the indigenous communities on the ground in the Arctic who have been wit witnessing massive craters exploding all over the Arctic. One indigenous leader told me they use, dr uh, they use drones to scout out the terrain and they are amazed at the number of craters that are now appearing in the Alaska tundra. Next slide. So that's a very critical story. Uh, you can go back to the previous slide. Um, that's a critical story that needs looking into, obviously, and here are some others. Um, of course, we know in Glasgow that at COP26, 110 countries signed a global methane pledge to cut methane emissions by at least 30% below 2020 levels by 2030. Um, we need to ensure that these pledges are actually acted upon because uh, last year, the UN Global Methane Assessment found that methane emissions would have to fall by 45% by 2030, not 30%, to stay below the 1.5 degrees Celsius upper limit. So each country's commitment toward reaching that 30% and more is ag absolutely essential. And uh, the work of journalists will be critical in revealing whether na national methane commitments are in fact meaningful and hopefully strengthened. Another critical story idea uh, is fossil fuel subsidies. The International Monetary Fund found that fossil fuels receive 5.9 trillion in direct subsidies in 2020, roughly $11 million every minute. And that's just 8% uh, of the total. The other 92% were implicit subsidies, including tax breaks and health and environmental damages that were externalized and not included in the cost of fossil fuels. Um, for those of us who were at COP26 last year, uh, we, we learned that there were hundreds of fossil fuel lobbyists, many embedded in national delegations. Uh, nevertheless, in Glasgow, many countries pledged to end all public finance for fossil fuels in 2022, but have they actually done so? If not, why not? We need absolutely need reporters to dig into the story and find out where those subsidies are going, who's profiting, and what that will mean for the methane pledge. Agricultural subsidies is another critical area. Um, a 2020 investigation by The Guardian and, and the Bureau of Investigative Journalism revealed that over the past decade, two banks, the World Bank's International Finance Corporation and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development provided 2.6 billion for pig, poultry, and beef farming, as well as dairy and meat processing. And the top five development banks have spent more than 4.6 billion in the agricultural sector over the last 10 years. What are those subsidies doing to methane emissions and how is that in turn undermining the global methane pledge? Another story that I think bears um, uh, deep investigation is why is it that small fossil fuel companies are some of the biggest methane emitters, at least in the United States? Uh, the New York Times uh, exposed the fact that the largest methane emitter in the U.S., Hillcorp Energy, emitted almost 50% more methane than ExxonMobil, the largest fossil fuel producer, despite pumping far less oil and gas. Four other relatively unknown companies, Terra Energy Partners, Flywheel Energy, Blackbeard Operating, and Scout Energy, each reported emitting more methane than many of the big oil and gas companies. So we need reporters to be digging into why it is that small companies are uh, releasing massive quantities of methane. 
A fifth idea is uh, the health effects and other impacts of methane. Um, the Harvard Chan School of Public Health recently found that people over 64 years of age die at much higher rates if they live within a half kilometer of a fracking site. And Stanford University's Rob Jackson, who serves on the board of Methane Action, found that poorly ventilated kitchens that cook with gas emit dangerous pollutants, even when the stoves are turned off. So we need more scrutiny of methane's impacts on health and the environment and how these costs are now being externalized. And finally, carbon markets. We need reporting to shine a light on carbon markets involving methane as we know they are prone to double counting, conflicts of interest, and perverse incentives to inflate baselines as a way of getting more credit than the actual emissions cuts are worth. Final slide. Bottom line, if we care about keeping warming to no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius globally, our common enemy this decade is rising methane levels in the atmosphere. And reducing methane levels in the atmosphere through both methane removal and emissions reductions are the lowest of the low-hanging fruits to get us onto a below 1.5 degrees Celsius trajectory. But ignorance and lack of clear, transparent information about methane is turbocharging global warming and getting the world further off track. Your work as journalists is essential in bringing the world back on track, and we are eager to work with you and provide all the sources and information we can. Thank you.